Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to this study, Ezekiel 33, let us carefully consider the points that are being made both from Scripture and from the Spirit of Prophecy. May these words be as the latter rain on a dusty earth ready to accept the very presence of God so that this work that is needed to be done may be completed and completed quickly. Will you join me now in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided. We thank you for the many answers to prayer that you give us for both those requests that are spoken and for those that are unspoken. We ask now, Father, for your guidance. We ask for your direction. Help us to understand what is to be addressed. Help us to contribute so that we may have a good conversation on these items. I thank you for each one that has come to this study and that contributes. I thank you also, Father, for those that will view this later. Direct us now. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. Be with us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit enlighten our minds. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, last week that we met, since I was gone this, this last Sabbath, we covered a paragraph that is before you again. Heavy responsibility rests upon those who stand in positions of trust in the cause of God. Now, there are those that are pretenders that believe that they are standing in the cause of God when they are not standing in the cause of God. The work of proclaiming the third angel's message should be carried forward in the power of the spirit. The present is a time of fearful peril. And those who stand in positions of responsibility are not to keep silent. Of what use are sleepy watchmen who cannot see the threatening danger and who do not warn the people? I had a conversation this last week with a friend. And at that time, he was advising me of the situation that he was encountering, that in the churches that he had been visiting, that they were choosing to accept the words of one who calls himself Brother Lawrence. They were choosing to accept the admonitions of Mother Teresa. They were choosing to set aside the spirit of prophecy. Are these representative of those who stand in positions of trust in the cause of God? Are we currently to rely upon Jesuit teachings, upon Russian mystics, or are we to rely upon those that, that come to the world with the understanding of Hinduism? Is this what God would have us to do? No, far from it. Now, what my friend encountered was that when he began to talk and present from the 1843 and the 1850 charts, this conference compensated pastor shut him down and made it clear that he was not welcome within an Adventist church. Many times we are going to find that there will be those that prefer to remain asleep, that prefer to accept unconsciousness of what the word of God says rather than changing to follow where God would have us to be. What do we want at this time? Do we want to be a sleepy watchman? Do we want to be as those that are not willing to warn the people? This is the, the, premise that I'll set, I will submit before you today. Now, this next unpublished document, written the 15th of June of 1898, the 25th day of the third month of the biblical year 5943, to my ministering brethren, I would say, prosecute this work with tact and ability, 
set to work the young men and the young women in our churches. Combine the medical missionary work with the proclamation of the third angel's message. Make regular organized effort to lift the churches out of the dead level into which they have fallen and have remained for days, years, for years. Send into the church workers who will set the principles of health reform in their connection with the third angel's message before every family and individual. Encourage all to take part in work of their fellow men and see if the breath of life will not quickly return to these churches. This is being written in 1898. And what is Mrs. White saying here? That in 1898, 10 years after the 1888 General Conference session and 54 years after October 22nd, 1844, the churches are in a dead level to which they have fallen and that they have chosen to remain at that level for years. If it was bad during her lifetime, how do we find it today? Brothers and sisters, at this point, we are seeing that there are many conference employees that are choosing that their churches are okay because they are asleep and they wish to cons- they wish to see them stay in that condition is this what we are told to do or are we to avoid this situation yeah. well one thing that i would say about this is that um i mean it's easy to look at the church but we really need to apply this to this movement we and, need to apply it to ourselves. Well, yeah, right. So it has to hit closer to home. And so when we look at, when we look at the movement right now, I mean, it, there's a lot of talk about studying and so forth and different, but there isn't really a work going on. And, and even with what we're doing, I mean, obviously, you know, I write papers, I put them online. We have the videos of our studies and people are watching them more and more people all the time, but there is a work to be done for Seventh-day Adventists in getting this message. And and this is what I believe God's calling us to do at this time, is to, is to figure this out, to cooperate with him in, in doing this. And I'm not really sure how to go about it. I mean, we know that it has to be done with tact and ability, um, two things which I generally lack. But, you know, God is telling us that we have to figure out how to to present this message to Seventh-day Adventists instead of just being, you know, studying among ourselves. So, so there is a work to do. And I wouldn't say we're necessarily asleep uh, or dead, but definitely we've been woken up and we need to be aroused to action. If we were to use this in an analogy, is the entire body, the entire body of the movement mm-hmm. awake. No. But individual aspects have been waking up, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and and we're going to see that God's hand is going to be in it. It's not going to be like, you know, like many people would say, well, what we need to do is organize. And we're going to organize the church and we're going to start, you know, uh, channeling funds in a certain direction and do a united effort. And And that has been done in the past. And, and it's been done in the past with, um, you know, when the Adventist church first organized, that's what they did. And, and it, in a sense, you could say it was successful in that the Adventist church grew, but it's not the final work that's to be done. Right. This is where God takes the work into his own hands. And, you know, it's not that it's disorganized. It's just organized under one head and, and the parts of the body cooperate with each other in doing that work. So, I mean, if you have people fighting amongst themselves, obviously they're not going to be accomplishing anything. And that's what I found, you know, personally in this movement is that there's a lot of battles going on, a lot of politics and those things can't, a church can't survive with them. It can't accomplish its task if that's the case, you know, and we even see it right now. Like it's, I, I, I could say it's annoying but I, I think in some ways 
maybe it's a, a better word is is kind of alarming. So you know we have the unity chat uh, on on WhatsApp, right? And you know just very simple things that anybody should be able to understand are being debated. And you know so we got Heliomar, whoever he is, just not making any sense. And we see this type of thing. People always. When the truth is presented and let us instead of taking the time to understand it, they just they just attack it. And and I take the time to understand what they're saying. Right. I mean, I really, really try. Um, So I'm not dismissive of anyone. But, uh, you know, this is really common for the movement in in a way. You know, people have all their little pet theories and they can't seem to to be united on what it is that we believe and on what it is we have to do. And so, um, you know, not to be critical of any individual people, but the problem in the Canadian group that I saw all the way through the time, you know, that I've been in the movement and the problem that existed within the movement itself is people have all their own little pet theories and their pet projects. and And they're not really willing to, just accept what God is doing. It's like everybody's got to have their control, and their say. And, you know, you always need to include as many people as possible. But um, for this work to be done, it's going to have to be under Christ. And, and that means individually we all have to, you know, follow Christ. And, and the work will be accomplished by those who follow Christ, even if there's not any external organization that brings them together to cooperate. Any other comments? Now, the whole focus of these studies is for us to be able to share ideas. So as we go forward, I want you to understand, I'm going to welcome your comments. I'm going to welcome your thoughts. I'm going to welcome conversation. Next. Well, I can say, Dwight, sorry, Dwight, Dwight and all that. Uh, the, the SDAs that I've been trying to share this with, they, uh, one of them flat admitted, he said, I don't understand anything you're saying. The, the point is they need to go back to the very basics, and that is connect with Christ. They need to study, and I kept emphasizing that, go back to the original message. Of, I'm no expert in this. I'm learning too. Go back to the original messages in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and be converted every day. That's a really hard saying for these people. One of the comments that Mrs. White made multiple times is we were to return and to give the message that brought people out of the churches from 1840, 41, 42, 43, and 44. Is that correct? Yes. Amen. And they choked. No. The way in which that was done was to be showing a prophetic message would that also be correct right now the adventist church and to some extent the movement have veered away from giving any kind of a prophetic message because there's too much worry about who is going to be offended by a message of warning to give up sin and to begin to work, walk again in the old paths. Now, this next paragraph, study how? Study faithfully the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. The work which is being done in medical missionary lines is the very work which Christ commanded his followers to do. Can you not clearly see that those who are engaged in this work are fulfilling the Savior's commission? Can you not see that it would please your Savior if you would lay aside all false dignity and learn in his school how to wear his yoke and carry his burdens? Just like the example that I gave a moment ago, sharing from the charts resulted in a brother being no longer invited to participating in Bible studies. It led to a brother no longer being welcomed into Adventist churches. Did this ever happen to the Savior? Yes, it did. 
How many times have any of us been told that we are not welcome, whether it has been in a corporate church, a home church, or within portions of this movement? Well, so far, they just walk out when I had the computer on with one of these presentations. Okay. We still have a lot to learn. The School of Christ is the highest education that human beings may attain to. Yet how many of us are looking to wear his yoke and carry his burdens? Is this not the instruction that is given to us today in order for us to be able to truly give a final warning message? The world needs evidences of sincere Christianity. Professed Christianity may be seen everywhere. But when the power of God's grace is seen in our churches, the members will work the works of Christ. Two weeks ago, we were addressing the point that there have been many that are saying, well, if this is truly a message of God, how come we cannot do miracles? Why can we not do the works of Christ? Therefore, if we can't do those works, this can't be the right message. We have not seen the power of God's grace in our churches. Our churches, our movement is barefoot of this grace. For we have not been doing the works of Christ. Natural and hereditary traits of character will be transformed. The indwelling of his spirit will enable them to reveal Christ's likeness. And in proportion to the purity of their piety will be the success of their work. Where is it that the spirit can dwell? Can the spirit dwell in a house filled with selfishness and greed? Can the spirit dwell where the teachings of man are seen as being superior to the teachings of Christ. What say you? Well, she tells us right there, natural and hereditary traits of character will be transformed. And then the indwelling of his spirit will enable them to reveal Christ's likeness. So we need to get rid of, we need to ask Christ to remove, to subdue, to transform our natural traits of character, which are offensive. And then he can use us. And it's a daily battle, just like Paul said. It's a daily battle for me. It's a daily battle for everyone. Are they engaged in it? I'm engaged in it. Do the rest of you agree with that? What say you? Yes. Keith, William and I do. All right. Thank you, sister. There are in our world many Christian workers who have not yet heard the grand and wonderful truths that have come to us. These are doing a good work in accordance with the light which they have. And many of them are more advanced in the knowledge of practical work than are those who have had great light and opportunities. Who is she describing of those that have had great light and opportunities? To whom is Mrs. White referring? And the Adventists. What do you think about that, brothers and sisters? Because she often says that. Yes, many, many times. In the ninth chapter of Ezekiel is portrayed the fate of the men of responsibility who have not glorified God by faithfulness and integrity. Read this chapter. Notice especially verses four to six. The Lord said unto him, go into the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at the ancient men which were before the house. At the appointed time, the Lord God of Israel will do his work 
most thoroughly. The 33rd chapter of Ezekiel is an outline of the work that God approves. Those in the positions of sacred trust, those honored of God by being appointed to stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion, are in every respect to be all that is embraced in the meaning of the word watchman. See verses 2, 6, and 7. They are to be ever on guard against the dangers, threatening the spiritual life and health and prosperity of God's heritage. We have no time to put forth anything but that which our Father has sought to teach us. Upon us, as ministers, God has placed a burden of solemn responsibility. Upon whom? Upon each of us. All of us. Go ahead, sister. Sorry. I just was saying all of us. Realizing that we are his chosen watchmen. We should have constant concern and forethought in regard to the state of the church. We should give much time to earnest prayer for divine wisdom and guidance in order that we may know how best to promote God's honor and glory. He has commissioned us to honor him, the omnipotent one, in every word and act. From him comes our maintenance. We are wholly dependent upon his sufficiency, his bounty for our support. Have we ever thought that our commission has been to honor God? Well, if it isn't, then what point is it? Go ahead, sorry. I was just saying, if it isn't to honor God, then what point is it? Like, I don't want to be honoring self. But yet... I have no purpose in life without God, so why would I want to be exalting self? Okay. So in a situation like this, so many would say that the Great Commission is to give a gospel message. How are we to give a gospel message if we wish to introduce human elements into it and set aside the message of God's grace and his character. Now we come to Ezekiel 33, verse 1. Again, the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchman, If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. What does this say to you? God wants us to be watchmen at the peril of our lives and the lives of those who are supposed to be warning. I always, this is Kathy, William's wife speaking. Yes, ma'am. I always thought that our commission was to teach the prophecies, our special, the Adventist special truths, but also share Jesus's love and what he did for us. But then again, I'm thinking, you know, you look in Daniel and Revelation and Ezekiel and um, uh, is it Isaiah? I think it is. I mean, I'm not as well-versed in the Bible as you guys are, so I do apologize. But I look in there, and it's talking about the prophecies and how the prophecies lead to Christ. Mm -hmm. Should we not say, hey, you need to be saved, or is that word incorrect? And second of all, should we just simply teach Christ's soon returning and how we can tell that it is through the Bible prophecies? I get confused about that because I'm like, Keith, are you telling people about Jesus? And that's William's middle name. Um, it, it's it's a struggle for me because I'm trying so hard to do what is right because I want to be prepared for when Christ returns and have my faith strong enough in order to stay on the right course. Um, so, Yes, if you can explain that, because I want to do what's right, you know. I want to be able to share my truths and my faith with others. So 
I'm trying to learn. <laughs> well, well, okay, thank you. So Kathy, here's um, a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's in the Review and Hills, uh, November 22nd, 1892. Okay. It's uh, the now, now I have it here in selected messages as well. So, but you can find it in Review and Herald, November 22nd, 1892. Let everyone who claims to believe that the Lord is soon coming search the scriptures as never before. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and blind the minds to the perils of the times in which we are living. Let every believer take up his Bible with earnest prayer that he may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit as to what is truth, that he may know more of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Search for the truth as for hidden treasures and disappoint the enemy. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning redeemer. Uh, this is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. And, and this next sentence is the one that I particularly want you to listen to. It says, for it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to present him to the world as revealed in types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of him. So to me, the main point here is that in order to know Christ, lots of times people talk about we get to know Christ, we've got to share Christ. But we don't do it in this way. That is, we don't lift him up as revealed in types. We don't lift him up as shadowed in symbols. We don't lift him up as manifested in the revelations of the prophets. Now, we may, you know, you know, quote the Gospels. So we may deal with the him unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples and the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. But we need all of these things. We need prophecy. We need, we need the whole Bible in order to know God. And of course, this only comes when somebody studies the scriptures or searches for them as for hidden treasure. Does that help? Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you so very much. I got a sense of peace listening to that. I didn't realize everything like that so i'm okay. i'm grateful thank you okay you're welcome god bless <clears throat> on this verse <clears throat> the alternate hebrew reading according to the translators would say then that he that hearing heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning if the sword come and take him away his blood shall be upon his own head on this, in Ezekiel 33, 4, would we consider this alternate phrase, he that hearing heareth, would we consider that to be a doubling? Um, well, I have to look at the Hebrew. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's a doubled word. So it's, it's um, yeah, they use the shama twice. Right, so the same Hebrew words use word is used twice in a row. So we've always applied this as being in relation to the second angel's message, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, because it is just a Hebrew way of creating emphasis, right? Like in dying, you shall die, right? In okay. Genesis, um, where it talks about eating of the fruit of the tree. You shall surely die. It says in dying, you shall die. I mean, they could have translated this. But he who surely hears the sound of the trumpet. I mean, you could you could apply it that way, but I'm just saying you can't take every time that the Hebrew expression of an emphasis is is then, you know, the second angel's message. I don't think you can do that because it's a pretty common way that Hebrew works to double a word. But I mean, here you you would have to have something else that connects it to the second angel, which I think it does. Well, but. My, my ultimate purpose in asking the question in the manner I did mm -hmm. is Ezekiel 33, 4, 
giving us the pattern so that we would understand that this is in relation to the warning of Revelation 18. Yeah, well, the thing about it is Ezekiel 33 is a doubling of Ezekiel 3, right? which, which I've pointed out a few times. Right. So in Ezekiel chapter 3, I mean, the first thing that's going to happen is uh, Ezekiel's going to eat this roll that he's that he's given, right? It's going to be in his mouth as honey for sweetness, but in his belly, obviously, it doesn't say about his belly, but, you know, it's it's that same roll that's going to be eaten, right? It's going to be sweet in your mouth as honey and bitter in your belly. But here he's just going to eat this roll, and then he's going to give a message, right? He's going to speak unto the house of Israel. And then, right. and then he's going to go into vision, and he's going to be carried away. He's going to be lifted up by the Spirit and brought to uh, them of the captivity at Tel Aviv, not the Tel Aviv in Israel, but the Tel Aviv in Babylon, uh, by the river Kibar. And there he's going to sit there in vision for seven days. Uh, it says he sit, sat there astonished uh, among them seven days. And that word is... Um, it's kind of interesting. Eight zero seven four, um, sham shamain, and here where it talks about hearing, that word is eight zero eight five, which is um, what was the number? What was the definition given or the pronunciation? Anyway, it's a similar word, even though it means something different. Eight zero. Let me see here. I'm sorry, I'm taking too long here. But so anyway, he's he's going to sit there astonished. So shama is 8085. So it's kind of interesting that he's astonished. It's Shamam. It's, it's almost the same, you know, almost spelt the same, even though I'm just trying to see if they're related. Shaman and Shema. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, but then um, what happens in, it says, it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Wherefore, you hear the word of, at my mouth and give the warning from me, right? So in chapter three, it's going to talk about the watchman. And, and so chapter 33 talks about the watchman as well. So there, there, it, so this is a doubling of Ezekiel three, right? And Ezekiel 33 comes after he has, uh, been made dumb, right? So remember, he's been made dumb since uh, Ezekiel 24. And and he's going to begin speaking here in Ezekiel 33. His mouth is going to be opened. He's he's now going to be speaking again. And I really think that this relates to this movement, that, that we have to take the warning that, that this is the time that we are in, is Ezekiel 33. I don't know if that makes sense to people. I didn't explain enough. But you, you get what I'm saying or not? Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? I think I'm, I'm beginning to grasp it. That's just, there is a message given in Ezekiel 3. So Ezekiel 3 is still going to be under his first vision, right? Right. And he's going to have this vision, and he's going to be sitting there among uh, the men that are in the captivity by the river uh, Kibar, right? right? Seven days. No, he literally doesn't do that. He's just in vision, right? And and because all that stuff up till at the end of chapter 7, is all in the same vision that he has in chapter 1. Uh, but he goes in vision and sits there, and at the end of the seven days while in vision, he then is given this message about being a watchman. So this is the first vision that begins his his work as a prophet. But in, in chapter 33, after the destruction of Jerusalem, when somebody who was there at the destruction of Jerusalem comes and tells him of it, that's when his mouth is going to be opened that day. And it actually happens the evening before the guy comes that his mouth is opened. So it's actually in the morning that the guy comes, but his mouth was opened in the evening, right? So so I think that relates to this movement, to this message, that there is a proclamation of a message that is repeated, right? Now, we could even say, well, it's Millerite history and our history. There's other ways we could apply it. But but that's the doubling, right, that I see is the second angel's message is being Ezekiel 33. So it's already there is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Even without the hearing heareth, he then he that hearing, hearing heareth. 
but it would really be, you know, he who he who surely hears the sound of the trumpet. You know, if you were going to be consistent on how they deal with the doubling. Now, in, in this situation and in being consistent, this hear, hearing heareth the sound of the trumpet. The trumpets are used to call people to a meeting, a convocation. They are also called to call people to worship. And they are sounded to advise people that it is time of warning and of war. Right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and the thing that's odd, just sorry about that, Dwight, but the thing that's odd in, in chapter three, it's before the destruction of Jerusalem, right? In chapter three, he's going to be given the same message after the destruction of Jerusalem, which, which is kind of odd because Jerusalem's already been destroyed, and yet he's, he repeats this message that was announcing the coming destruction. So, it's just kind of odd that he does that. Or God does it, you know, because God's the one giving the message. Now, the passage itself. Then he that hearing heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning. If the sword come and take him away, gives a reference back to what we had seen before in Ezekiel 18, verse 13, which reads, Hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Here again, we are being told that if we reject the sound of the trumpet, if we reject the sound of warning, if the sword that is coming upon Jerusalem shall come and take him away, then his blood shall be upon his own head. What does this mean to any of you, that his blood will be upon his own head? How else could we say this? I get the idea that it, the blood of others that we have failed to warn is upon our head. What about, brother, we if, does this also mean that if his blood shall be upon his own head, that we then our finding our blood is not taken before the mercy seat, that we are then responsible for our own sins and we are not forgiven of our sins. Is that possible? That's what it sounds like to me. I, I see a shade where it could be in that it is a sin not to not to give the warning. Would that be? Would Agreed. Fit? Because we are watching Right, we're supposed to be watching. So the blood of not giving the warning, like, like the blood of others, when I think of it, you know, the, where I have failed God and failed to give the example of his character and live it before the world, that I'm responsible in, in, in some ways because it's my choices that have led to that failure. So the blood of others where I've been in contact with who have been interested in learning about God that have been turned away because of my example of failing in where I failed uh, that I feel unless repented of which I have you know I ask forgiveness and God to fix it but that if not repented of would be upon our heads right now Ezekiel 33 5 he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning his blood shall be upon him but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul is the first part of this verse giving reference back to ezekiel 33 4. Mm -hmm. we have before us a warning we have before us what god is telling us is the work that he approves as we are going through this portion of ezekiel the question was asked two weeks ago do we want to be as those that receive not God's blessing, that re- that choose not to sigh and cry for the abominations found in the land, that cast out those that are sighing and crying? And what happens to those that are not sighing and crying for the, the abominations found in the land, according to Ezekiel 9? 
What is their ultimate fate? This is a tricky question, Blake, for me. It sounds because as it, if they there, won't be. There are times in there are times in my self pity where I want to be lost, where I say, God, if I have to be lost, at least make my life worth something to others and be a blessing to them. I actually pray that. Okay, Sister Ann. So it's a tricky question. Yeah, I'm sorry to butt in like that, but it, it sounds like the ones that aren't sighing and crying, that aren't grieved for their own sins and for the sins that they see in the church and around them are not going to be sealed. We should be in a state of repentance. I mean, I'm thinking of Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. He was praying for himself or sins that personally he probably hadn't even done, but he was interceding for his people. So in a way, when we do that, we are bearing the sins of others and asking God to have mercy and to change us. And how can God forgive us if there's no repentance? Amen. Amen and amen. Now, our time is coming to a close for today. My challenge for each of you is to prepare to cover these first 10 verses of Ezekiel 33 for next week. We have much that we're going to have to discuss. We have much that we're going to need to be prepared upon. So I cannot do this for you. I cannot tell you exactly what we're going to be finding. But if you prepare, you may find what we're going to be covering this next week to be giving us a pattern so that we may understand more fully the work that is yet before us. Any other thoughts or any other questions at this time? Shall we then close in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunities that you are providing us that we may hear the trumpet, that we may understand the sword, that we may surrender our everything to you. We pray, Father, for your blessing and the meeting that is to follow. We ask, Father, for your guidance, that you will help us and direct us so that we may understand more, so that we may follow you in the way that we are to do, so that we may more completely honor you and represent your character to all of those around us. Help us to give this warning to Jerusalem to the ancient men, so that your word will not return unto you void. Be with us now. For this we ask, for this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.